Throughout the worst pains of a drawn-out death, Tolstoy leads us mercilessly, yet with enough glimpses of compassion to the final hours when Ivan cries out desperately that he doesn't want it, he doesn't want to die. In Russian, I don't want, я не хочу. But somehow he gets stuck on the syllable U. You remember the uh, 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 Anatoly with his uh, am amputated leg. Я не хочу, and that U moans through the, resonates through the house so that no one can miss its sound. And of course the poor widow is driven to distraction. That ooh, 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 that very physical sense of what the pain of death might mean. And yet, at the very last minute, there was no fear. Because in place of death, he saw light and a certain kind of joy. And he could no longer find his former customary fear of death. For him, Becoming dead meant that death no longer existed. By overcoming death, he conquered death, by the way, a very Christian idea, a hymn that's sung in Russia at Easter time. And in all of Tolstoy's many scenes of death, this is the closest, it seems to me, that he came to the kind of transcendence that he so desperately thought and mistakenly thought he had at the end of uh, Anna Karenina. It's a very powerful story. The second great obsession with which Tolstoy continually struggled was the passion connected with physical sex. Now at this point you might say, well, he was obsessed with sex and death, what else is there in life? And you may have a point. In the case of Anna Karenina, as in the first unhappy marriage of Pierre Bizuchov, Tolstoy recognizes the depth and the power of lust. There's a marvelous scene in War and Peace where Pierre Bizuchov uh, is proposing to uh, remember La Belle Hélène, the beautiful, the extraordinarily beautiful, and by the way, very sexy daughter of Prince Vasily, by the way, very well played in the American film by Anita Ekberg. I think she was perhaps the best actress in that film. Pierre knows that he's doing something wrong. He knows that this is not the woman for him, that th this lust that he's obsessed by is not going to be the, the source of a happy marriage, and yet he can't help himself. And as he gets close to her, she suddenly rips off his glasses. She says, take off these glasses, and she kisses him, and he says, you know, I know there's something that's said at a time like this, and I can't think of what it is. He thinks, and suddenly he says, je vous aime. <laughs> and it comes out, and they're, they're engaged. Of course, it turns into a very, happy, a very unhappy marriage, a marriage which is the uh, torture of Pierre Bezouchev's life. The pain is only ended with the death of the, La Belle Hélène herself. Even Levin himself, in the diaries which he showed his intended bride, uh, suffers from the call of the flesh. It tells Kitty all the terrible things he did as a young man. Uh, in a novella published in 1891, the Kreutzer Sonata, obviously referring to a work by Beethoven, Tolstoy expresses his most ferocious views and feelings on the subject. This novella is in some ways very, very unpleasant reading, showing an older Tolstoy expressing deep disenchantment with marriage and even with physical love. Yet, at the same time, it's one of his most powerfully expressed works. It's interesting that the narration of the story takes place in a railroad car. Clearly, Tolstoy sees the railroad. You remember Anna Karenina. Tolstoy sees the railroad as a terribly destructive force within Russia. He contrasts it to transportation by horse. A horse is a living organism. A horse can smell. A horse has a sense of direction. The, uh, the locomotive, of course, is an iron monster, which can only go on the tracks and which, which works as a machine. And this monster is something terribly heavy and terribly threatening. It stands in many, many ways as a, as a statement about death. And of course, we remember that the Oblonsky tried very hard to get into the commercial direction of the newly established Russian railway companies in his life. The railroad is no place for a living and a sympathetic character like Oblonsky, according to Tolstoy. The story opens under an epigraph taken from the book of Matthew. It's a famous warning by Jesus about anyone who looks upon a woman with longing, such a person has already committed adultery in his heart. Uh, the narrator of the story, riding in, in the train, again in the railroad train, looks about him and can't help but notice an especially nervous man with extraordinarily brilliant eyes. He resists all attempts to open conversation, but when the general discussion turns to a theme of great concern in Russia at that time, and of course it'll seem very familiar to us, the position of women in society and the nature of love and marriage, the old man suddenly becomes extremely articulate. It turns out He's a man connected with a well-known scandal in Russia at that time. He's murdered his wife. And when the other members of the car leave his presence, he goes into a long, passionate recounting of the events and feelings leading up to the murder. 
He argues the maintenance of conjugal love is impossible, that physical love between a man and a woman, even in marriage, can only lead to the worst kind of sin and degradation. When his interlocutor objects that, well, such an extreme position against physical love could lead to the end of the human race. The passionate man agrees and says that would be a good thing, long predicted by all religions and the discoveries of science. He also argues paradoxically that women have domination over the world simply due to the fact that men have all the rights. By acting on the passions of men, he, he says, the, the woman subdues them and gains a terrible power over them. In this way, she exacts vengeance for the submissive role which society has attempted to assign her. I'm not sure how contemporary thought would deal with this argument. He makes a curious analogy between the position of Jews and the position of women in Russia. He says, uh, Jews who have to face terrible repression in Russia are forced to be petty merchants. They use their financial power to avenge their humiliation in the same way women use their position as objects of sensual desire to bring about the slavery of men. While Tolstoy and many other instances showed considerable sympathy for the problems of Jews in Russia, including, by the way, a very interesting letter to Sholem Aleichem, the famous Jewish writer himself. Here, his character is making a statement about so-called Jewish financial power that you'd ordinarily expect to meet in anti-Semitic propaganda. One can explain this, it seems to me, not only in Tolstoy's case, but also in Dostoevsky's case, by the extreme passions aroused in the character of the story that somehow deal with the subconscious feelings that many Russians have about people of other nationalities and other cultures. It turns out that the man's wife had been performing music in their house with a handsome young man who was also a fine musician. The husband goes on to describe the terrible passion expressed in Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata. He shows so effectively how Beethoven's art transports the listener to another realm of consciousness that the reader can see how the wife is swept away by her passion for the man. It's interesting, by the way, that some of Beethoven's most powerful music was sponsored and inspired by Razumovsky. Some of you may know the middle quartets of Beethoven, the Razumovsky quartets, which were done because the Russian ambassador to Vienna recognized in Beethoven a very powerful talent and commissioned him to write quartets with Russian themes. Uh, Beethoven used a Russian theme for the first and the second quartet, but the third one he made up his own <laughs> Russian theme. So much for Russian themes, according to Beethoven. Well, it's only a matter of time before the husband discovers the real attraction between them. And Tolstoy describes in agonizing detail how the husband's knife enters his wife's flesh under the ribs. This is all the more terrible when we realize that Tolstoy was dictating the story to his own wife. That Sofya Andreevna, who had done what I told you before, had to go through the experience of hearing this powerful tale of a husband sticking a knife into the body of his wife. As you might imagine, the story aroused tremendous dismay among Tolstoy's readers, and I must say, uh, I understand how they felt. In replying to this, Tolstoy replies explicitly that physical love is an unworthy object for men and women, even within the marriage bond. Within the story, we see quite explicitly Tolstoy's position taken to the extreme. The end of the human race would not be a bad thing. It might even be an end to be desired. You know, this is a hard message to take from the author who created the intense and loving world of War and Peace and Anna Karenina. It's, at one of the same time, is deeply dismaying and deeply moving. And that's as much a part of the genuine Tolstoy as is the kind of love that we've talked about in these other novels. I think I've made this point before, but here we see it come wildly and flamingly uh, to the front. There's something in Tolstoy that drives us away at the very same time that there's a talent and a notion of love and a notion of family life that draws us in in a way that very few other writers can do. This tension is part, it seems to me, of the great power of his writing. Tolstoy lived out his remaining years in the last decade of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th. His household had become a fa world famous and a place for widespread pilgrimage. Many musicians visited Tolstoy. Uh, Tolstoy obviously had a, a very peculiar kind of obsession with music. Uh, there's the famous incident of Wanda Landowska, the great Polish uh, harp, uh, harpsichordist, who came to visit him and his, his, his very moved reactions to what she did. 
There's also uh, a very interesting description by Sergei Kusevitsky, who later on became the very famous, internationally famous conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, who tells how in his younger life in Russia, he and a group of musicians went to play for Tolstoy. And when they played, uh, he describes the tears that came to Tolstoy's eyes, the, the deep emotion that he felt through music. And then later on we read in Tolstoy's diary a description of that very same moment, and Tolstoy describes it in a much drier and a much more condemning way. Well, these people thought they came to me with music. The music was not at all good. There was just one small part of it was any good. The rest of it I had to suffer through. The difference, of course, between what, what he said to them and what he really felt, again, is somewhat hard to take in an author who emphasizes so strongly the expression of natural feeling. Tolstoy, of course, by this time, the estate at Yasnaya Palyana stood in the imagination of the world for something very, very broad and very, very powerful. It seems that the whole world uh, came to the door of Tolstoy. It seems that everybody was interested in what he had to say. He had correspondence with people all over the world, and by the way, he, he, he was fluent uh, not only in Russian but also French, German, and English, and this was very, very impressive. But at the same time, an event happened that was very painful, probably to Tolstoy, and certainly to his family. Tolstoy uh, had published a novel called a Resurrection, Voskresenia, where, among other things, he described a mass, not with the, as the church saw, the necessary proper respect toward the mass and the deep feelings experienced uh, by the, the words of Christ and the words of the gospel that are done by the mass. Rather, he concentrated on the fine leather boots of the priest and the noise that these boots made when they squeaked as the priest moved, making certain, mo making certain motions which might, be, uh, which might be prayer. But of course, as far as Tolstoy were concerned, they were simply physical movements. Uh, Tolstoy does this quite often in his novels, where he reduces things that we normally see as part of something that makes sense. He takes the thing that makes sense out of it, and all you see are physical motions, as if it were seen by somebody from another culture who com was completely unaware of what those motions meant. Uh, the church found this uh, very offensive, and uh, eventually Tolstoy was excommunicated from the Russian church. As a matter of fact, there were several cartoons at the time that showed a tiny, tiny church being surmounted by a huge Tolstoy who was much bigger than the church. And of course, Tolstoy uh, had a somewhat uh, larger notion, a somewhat different notion of Christianity, a notion, as he saw it, of the way Christ would deal with the world. It's almost a reprise of Dostoevsky's uh, Grand Inquisitor. Uh, the presence of Christ in the world is sometimes very, very difficult for those who claim they want to follow Christ. Of course, the Orthodox Church saw Tolstoy as some kind of a heretic. Tolstoy believed that this was the only genuine kind of Christianity. And then, of course, came the famous death of Tolstoy when he, he ran away from the house. Uh, he was on a railroad on the way to the famous monastery when he took, uh, he took uh, ill, he took sick, and um, uh, the, the dying Tolstoy was put on the bed of the station master at a city called Astapovo. And of course, when people heard that he was dying, the whole world came, including his wife who was trying to find him. They wouldn't let his wife come to him. They were afraid the shock would kill him. He died, and he could not be buried in hallowed land. Instead, he was buried on a, on a small knoll in the midst of a birch forest which he had once uh, planted, the white birch bark contrasting with the dark green of the ivy on that knoll. And he's buried under a famous stick that he and his brother had found. They called it the stick of reconciliation and love. And so instead of being given a church burial, he was buried under the stick of reconciliation and love.